And give everyone a minute to trickle in. Okay. Hello to everyone coming into our um, Zoom webinar this evening. I'm Erica with Green Apple Books, and thank you all for joining us for our event with Alec Ross and Andreas Karelis. Tonight, we are celebrating the release of Alec Ross's latest book, The Raging 2020s. Just before we get started, I would like to let you know about a few upcoming events we have at Green Apple. This Thursday, the 21st, Tiffany Yannick will be here discussing her novel, Monster in the Middle with Edwidge Danticat. And this Friday, the 22nd, Teresa K. Miller is joined by fellow poets Roxanne Beth Johnson and Jenny Chi to celebrate her collection, Borderline Fortune, in person here at Ninth Avenue. For more information on our event calendar, please visit greenapplebooks.com slash event. And tonight, our first featured guest is Andreas Corellis. Andreas Corellis is the author of Climate Courage, which we have right here. <laughs> And he's also the founder and executive director of Revolve, a nonprofit organization that empowers people around the country to help nonprofits in their communities go solar and raise awareness about the benefits of clean energy. He is a dedicated clean energy advocate with over 15 years of environmental and renewable energy experience. He lives and works in San Francisco. And Alec Ross is one of the world's leading experts on innovation, author of New York Times bestselling, The Industries of the Future, he is currently a distinguished visiting professor at the University of Bologna Business School and a board partner at Amplo, a global venture capital firm. Enjoy the discussion, everyone. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, for, thank you all for having me. Um, look, what I thought I would start with this evening are just um, a few remarks uh, about giving some context to the book. And then I was actually going to read a little bit um, from one of the chapters. Um, again, my name is Alec Ross. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from Baltimore, Maryland, even though doing these book events is much, 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 much more fun uh, doing it in person. Uh, I do like the fact that we're able to do these digitally and I'm able to do I'm able to reach San Francisco from my home in Baltimore, which is sort of a nice thing. Uh, by way of a little bit of additional background, I've, I've had a life that sort of lived at the intersection of uh, government, having worked for President Obama for six years, nonprofits, having been a social entrepreneur, and now, and now writing and teaching, um, but basically living and working in the world of ideas. And with that, I'm just, I'm so pleased and honored that um, some of you chose to join us this evening so that we could have a little bit of exchange of some of these ideas so that I could introduce uh, this book, The Raging 2020s, to you. And I want to particularly thank Andreas, who's himself an accomplished author focusing on climate, uh, for being my principal interlocutor, um, asking, uh, as, is, you know, starting the discussion with, a, with some questions. And I hope for, for those of you who are participating as well that you won't hesitate um, to participate in the discussion as well. Uh, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and start, and I'm, I'm going to actually sp spend a few, just a minute or two, reading from smack dab in the middle of the book, um, the chapter five. And the, ch the chapter is entitled Foreign Policy. Does every company need its own State Department, Pentagon, and CIA? So this is just, just take a few minutes, but to, just to give you a, a flavor of what's inside. In the months prior to the outbreak of civil war in Syria, I led a State Department delegation on a controversial trip to Syria that included a sit down with Bashar al-Assad. Our intention was to muscle the Syrian dictator on a series of security issues in the field of technology. The weaponization of widely available consumer technology was making it easier to surveil, spread disinformation, and both develop and destroy political movements. Our delegation was there to apply political and economic pressure to try to get Assad moving in the right direction. 
The thing that made this delegation walking into Assad's office different from any other was that it was not comprised of diplomats or government officials from the Pentagon or CIA. It was comprised of senior executives from American companies, including Cisco Systems, Microsoft, and others. Our view was that the companies held the power to be more persuasive under the circumstances and given the topic. Not all of the world's problems can be solved by governments and citizens alone. Uh, tax avoidance offers a fairly unique issue where the world's governments all lose out and stand to gain together by ending the race to the bottom. But other issues we face as the 21st century unfolds are far naughtier. Some, like the weaponization of AI and data and cyber war, break along geopolitical fault lines, pitting major powers against each other with citizens hanging in the balance. Still larger dangers, like climate change, loom so totally and immediately that all hands are needed on deck, governments, citizens, and corporations of every nation. In the case of Assad and Syria, digital technology did end up having de deadly effects. The Assad regime followed digital organizing on open social media platforms, including Facebook, and then targeted attacks at the locations of protests organized online. When they detained people, they would take their mobile phones, force them to log on to Facebook, and make kill or let live decisions based on the person's posts, and Facebook friends. The Syrian government developed Android apps that outwardly appeared to be apps tied to the COVID pandemic, in one case masquerading as an app to take users' temperatures, but which also served as powerful spyware, accessing users' data, texts, and contact lists, and providing real-time geolocation data to the Syrian government. America and our technology companies did not persuade Assad. Instead, he stood with Russia, and in the same way that Russian aircraft bombed Assad's Syrian opponents, Russia and hackers who worked inside, inside and outside government conducted the cyber war for Assad. Companies and countries were combatants. The entire cyber war in Syria blurred the distinction between what is being done by business and what is being done by government. And that's really sort of a, a subtext of what goes through the raging 2020s, which is that in many respects, we are now governed more by companies than we are by countries. You know, we usually think of companies being uh, subsidiary to the state, to government power. And what, we've, what, what I find now and a lot of what I write about is that on thorny foreign policy issues as far away as Syria to things closer to home like setting the minimum wage, it's increasingly the case that we are more governed by companies than we are by countries. And this book, The Raging 2020s, tries to talk a little bit, tries to present some ideas for how we can sort of refine the equilib equilibrium between the governing, the governed, uh, and America's corporations. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll lead it, I'll, I'll hand things over to you, Andreas, to sort of uh, guide our discussion from here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alec. Uh, that was a really um, insightful piece uh, that you read. And again, it, it speaks to, you know, the experience that you've had, uh, you know, sort of in that um, uh, context. And, and I guess, yeah, maybe that's a good place to start, you know, um, you know, looking at your biography, you know, you're a best-selling author, you've worked in government, in tech, um, a beer delivery guy, uh, you know, it sounds like, uh, you know, you've had this breadth of experience. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about your personal life journey and how that helped shape the ideas uh, that are in the book. Sure. So I, you know, I come writing this book from two very different perspectives, you know, one growing up in, in West Virginia, and then after college teaching in inner city Baltimore. So, you know, one community, um, one community, you know, sort of the American heartland and, and the public schools and what we would call sort of rural America. The other, a very urban environment, a very different environment, but both, both of which have struggled um, in the past decades, you know, both of which never found their footing uh, 
in today's technology rich knowledge based economy. And so that's sort of the one prism I see this from is, you know, coming from West Virginia, living and teaching in Baltimore. I'm speaking to you today from Baltimore. My wife is is still a, a, a school teacher in Baltimore's public schools. And then the other eye that I see these issues from is somebody who did become an entrepreneur. Um, and after being an entrepreneur, went into government as a presidential appointee, who's now a board partner in a venture capital fund with more than a billion dollars of assets under management. So these are sort of two wildly different perspectives on the world. Um, and so I try to bring a perspective on the changes that have taken place in America and in the world based on seeing it from these two very different angles, you know, one, the world of labor um, and one, the world of capital and living now in the world of capital. Um, I do see how, you know, our laborers, how America's workers in particular uh, have really been in many respects, the losers in the economy over the last 30 years. Um, if we go back to my sophomore year in college, I'm 49 years old. If we go back to when I was 19 years old, if the rate of inequality had remained the same in the United States over the last 30 years, it would have meant an additional 50 trillion, trillion with a T, $50 trillion going to um, workers um, earning at the 90th percentile or below which wow. comes to about $1,100 per worker per month. And so now living in the world of capital, I see that in the world of capital, it's sort of a heads I win, tails you lose world. And so having lived in the world of labor, having lived and worked in the world of labor, having lived and worked in the world of capital, I do have to recognize if I'm being intellectually honest, that I now am in the heads I win, tails you lose world. And there is um, there's some things that we can and should be done to take all the wealth and well-being that we're creating and make sure that it's more broadly shared. We're making a lot, you know, we are generating lots of wealth and well-being in the world. But what we've gotten wrong over the last three to four decades is how we distribute it. Um, we're creating lots of bounty, but there's very little spread. And so that perspective you know, Andreas, to your question, I think comes from the, pers you know, the almost schizophrenic existence I've had of on the one hand, you know, public schools in West Virginia and teaching in public schools in Baltimore. And on the other, you know, working as a presidential appointee and being a board partner in a billion dollar venture capital fund, two worlds couldn't be more different. Yeah. And that's, an, an extremely unique perspective that, that most people don't have, which, um, you know, really rings true throughout the book. Um, speaking of which, you know, you, uh, you know, into this, you know, to the, to the disparity you just talked about, um, uh, you know, the inequality, uh, you titled the book, The Raging 2020s. Um, I feel like we all can relate to that title, um, even without sort of, you know, looking into the deeper context, um, you know, certainly over the last two years, if not the last five or six, it seems like, every day there's something that is um, really sort of creating feelings of rage, overwhelm, anxiety um, in, our, in our daily uh, realities, um, something out of the ordinary of what we would normally expect. It's, it's sort of not, this is not normal has been kind of a thing. Um, so yeah, tell me about you know, how you came to this title and also just what compelled you to write this book at, at this time. Sure, so first to the title, um... I think people are seeing and feeling rage, the likes of which is sort of unique in the last, you know, you have to go, you have to go back to the depression, um, the American depression, and even during the depression, what's interesting is it was depression, it was depressed, it was not raging, there's something mm. there's a, there's a sort of ferocity uh, to America's distress right now, um, that hasn't existed since the Civil War. Um, but having said that, another reason why I chose this title, first of all, it's obviously a play on the Roaring Twenties, um, but, but it has a dual connotation. So mm -hmm. most of us, when we think of raging, um, we think of raging with anger. But if you ask my 19-year-old son, raging has an implicitly positive connotation, like a great party at midnight. 
<laughs> and so, you know, part of this, this, what this book, this book is a, is a, I would say optimistic, but realistic book. And one of the key theses is that uh, if this decade concludes better than it began and it got, it's gotten off to a lousy beginning with, you know, uh, you know, a, a, an attempt at a coup d'etat and a pandemic. Mm. But if the decade concludes with our having a trajectory more towards Star Trek and less toward um, Mad Max, it, it <laughs> is is really up to us. And whether the dec whether the the decade becomes one that is raging like a great party or raging with anger, um, that mm. dual connotation is part of why I, I chose the title. Also because it does harken back to the Roaring Twenties. And one of the things that I think is interesting from an from a intellectual and historic perspective is, if you think about the 1920s, it began uh, in, a, in, in a very, very similar situation of distress. You know, coming off of World War I, which saw an enormous body count, um, the Spanish flu, uh, which killed a huge number of people. And then in the 20s, um, it roared. It roared economically. Uh, there was a, a, an artistic and, and cultural renaissance. But then there was an economic collapse mm. at the end of the decade. And there was a time to sort of rewrite the social contract. And what's interesting is if you take like three countries, all of whom were in similar financial condition, Germany, Italy, and the United States, Italy at that moment of economic distress, tilted towards fascism. Germany tilted towards Nazism and the United States tilted toward the New Deal mm. of Franklin Roosevelt. And I think that we are, you know, we are at risk of entering another tran a transition phase where we in essence sort of rewrite our social contract, where we radically reorient our systems of, of, of governance or we make big choices about our systems of governance. And we in the United States right now can go the way of a new deal, or we are also perfectly capable of making the kind of misstep that Italy and, or Germany did a hundred years ago and tilting toward, toward fascism. So that is an, as an explanation, both of the title, but also to the second part of your question, why I wrote the book, because I did believe we were at this moment of inflection. Um, mm -hmm. And while I, you know, have a background as an entrepreneur and I'm working in technology policy and, and, and such things, I'm actually, I actually have a, a degree in history. And so I see a lot of these technological and economic driven changes through the perspective of history and, and what that can instruct us. Absolutely. No, and, and thank you for that. And I think, uh, you know, to that point, you, you really frame in the introduction uh, this, you know, very elegant description of how our society works, of you know, industry playing this huge role in all of our lives, government sort of meant to regulate said industry, and that citizens have this role of electing the uh, leaders. And so that's sort of typically how we've uh, sort of operated. And that now that's changing where you're seeing sort of this corporate uh, you know, amassing of power and sort of this weakening of government. And I, I, I think that's just a, a very astute sort of description of how I think we all are generally looking around and saying, my goodness, you know, what's happening here? Um, I wonder if you could, you know, tell us a little bit more, you, know, you mentioned sort of the seventies as sort of being this time when that sort of trend started. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how you saw that happening, you know, from a historical perspective and, and what does that mean for us today? You know, is there a way forward, uh, you know, like you said, a new deal way forward, um, you know, that sort of read sort of change, you know, that changes that balance. Sure. And, you know, I should say from the outset here, I don't hate business. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm pro business, so to speak, I'm a capitalist. Um, but what I do believe is that business ought to be in the, in, in the business of business and government ought to be in the in the business of governing. But in a in a world where the federal minimum wage hasn't been raised since 2008 in 13 years, when government isn't the institution that raises, for example, the minimum wage, it means that the minimum wage is raised by Walmart and Amazon. When mm. they decide that the minimum wage goes up, 
they suddenly are governing us. Mm. Uh, you know, you're an expert. You know, I'm looking over your shoulder there and seeing your great book, Climate Courage. Um, you know, we are in danger right now of uh, legislation failing in Washington and, and, and the United States. Once again, this would be the third time, the mm -hmm. third time um, that the United States will have failed a major multilateral climate test. Um, as a matter of government, you know, you go back to Kyoto um, and the United States was one of the few governments globally um, to not ratify the, the Kyoto Accords. You go to the Paris Climate Agreements, you know, after Trump was elected, we receded. Now um, we are seeing we're in danger of a total collapse of the climate provisions in, um, in President Biden's proposed legislation. So in that world where government isn't setting climate standards, business does it. You know, when Walmart mm. decides to change its, the pa its packaging of um, detergent, you know, and set standards and, and, and set this, the climate standards and the sustainability standards and in so doing, do it for, for its entire supply chain, it's doing so in the absence of government leadership. Um, in, in the absence of actually of actual governing. Um, to your question of where this really began to accelerate, it really began to accelerate in earnest after, after um, the end of the Cold War. You know, it, it was a process that had begun as we sort of navigated from a shareholder, from a stakeholder model of capitalism to a shareholder primacy capital of, uh, of shareholder primacy model of capitalism in the 1980s. But through the Cold War, um, there, was, there were a lot of areas of bipartisan consensus, um, including just about all, all foreign policy, by the way. But after the Cold War, a lot of which, what held the country together was lost. Um, and so it's really been since then um, that we saw three three dynamics that I describe in the book emerge that significantly throttled back our ability to govern. Uh, and I describe them as kludgeocracy, fetocracy, and brain drain. Um, and very, very briefly on them, kludgeocracy is the idea that, you know, we could build a bridge a hundred years ago and suddenly we can't build bridges anymore. Um, we built a national highway system 70 years ago, yet widening a road by one lane now is impossible and would cost billions of dollars. We created ma you know, public mass transit programs you know, decades and centuries ago. Now it seems almost impossible to do so. And that's because of clutch in s substantial part because we've made the operations of government so complex and so expensive that something like building a bridge or building a public transit system is something that we, we did a hundred years ago but we seemingly can't do now. Vitocracy speaks to the divisions of government. You know, what we are seeing right now, if you go to the homepage of the New York Times or CNN or Fox News for that matter, what you will see are examples of vitocracy where the where we are so divided, it's like Hutu versus Tutsi. It is tribal mm. and there's no common ground to be found. Um, and to the extent that there are one or two people who see themselves uh, you know, within that wedge there, it gives them an inordinate power. But being able to do anything of a sweeping nature uh, becomes incredibly difficult. And then the third thing is brain drain. Um, you know, again, through the Cold War, you know, America's top graduates, would, you know, if you were a top graduate in economics, going to work at the Treasury Department was prestigious. Top graduates in the humanities would go to work at the State Department or the CIA. Mm. Um, these were these were the most prestigious places you could go to work. But then, you know, after the Cold War, that flipped, and going into government was viewed as sort of a second or third tier um, profession. People did people went to McKinsey or to Goldman Sachs or did what I did and went in to teach for America. And so what we've seen is the appeal of government becoming substantially diminished. So very, very few people choose to make government their career. And among the best who do, they tend to do it for a few years and then they leave because you can, have, you can make more money. You can, in many re respects, have more power. 
and you can get more done working in business. So those three things, kleptocracy, vitocracy, and brain drain, I think have really created the stasis in government and have created this very strange world we live in right now, it, this very strange country we live in right now where we are more governed by companies than we are by countries. Yeah, no, that's well thank you for that um that breakdown and uh yeah, I I, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, you, you talked a little bit about climate change. And so I have a question here to kind of drill down a little bit more on that, um, because I think it helps to flesh out this, you know, this description. Um, you know, obviously, yeah, what we're seeing right now, actually, you know, Senator Joe Manchin from your home state of West Virginia, uh, you know, is is essentially having this sort of veto power over the uh, reconciliation bill. Um, and he's basically, you know, looking to gut the most significant climate legislation that we've ever seen. And, um, you know, it's also, you know, not lost on us that he has a $5 million stake in a coal brokerage, you know, makes a half a million dollars a year from it. It's his family business. Um, and at the same time, you know, just recently, Exxon Mobil lobbyists, you know, were caught on tape bragging about that they meet with Joe Manchin every week. So I think, you know, to that point, when we look at climate change. I, I think that I think that very much demonstrates sort of, you know, you, t you talk about in the book, um, you know, the money, the role of money in politics, lobbying, Citizens United, uh, etc. So I wonder, you know, given that perspective, what we see happening right in front of us right now, is that possible of changing? Do you see there being this sort of readjustment of sort of governments being able to regulate industry? in the time that we have left to solve the climate crisis um, or not, you know, and if not, how do you think, you know, it sounds like, you know, how do you think businesses or otherwise can step up, you know, in the fight uh, to, to save us from the climate crisis? Yeah, look, I think so. Um, and I'll just point to a few examples from history where um, things looked very, very dark, um, but where we then made change. So, and, and you're gonna have to excuse me for sort of geeking out for a minute here. Please. <laughs> um, but there, there was a period called the Engels Pause, and this was from about 1800 to 1840. This was, this was the 40 years during which, and through most of Europe, we saw the rise of industrialization and we saw labor go from farm to factory, from country to city. But it was also the sort of, it was the industrialization of the Charles Dickens novels, you know, 11 year olds losing their hands in the factories. Um, enormous, wealth created, driven by technology, driven mm -hmm. by technological innovation, by industrialization, but, but the well-being was not broadly shared. What then happened? Um, well, there, there was the largest wave of revolutions in Europe's history. Mm. Um, there were ideological movements like Marxism. The Communist Manifesto was written in 1848. So you saw this rage, I mean, literally a wave of revolutions, um, ideological movements, again, like Marxism, um, what ultimately calmed things down and in a certain respect, um, being mindful of its externalities, made industrialization work. What made industrialization work was in essence sort of was rewriting our social contract. Mm -hmm. So as we innovated technologically, we also innovated in our public policy. We said, yes, you can work in factories, but not until you're 16 years old. And oh, by the way, we're going to create this thing called a minimum wage. Uh, the European unions of the, of the mid 19th century had this idea of a weekend. So instead of a six day work week, where the only day you get off is Sunday, the day of our Lord, you get two days, one after another, Saturday and Sunday, the con very concept of the weekend, uh, the concept of, of, a, of a pension. Hey, yeah, you can work in a factory and after 25 or 30 years, you can leave and you'll get some percentage of your, your final salary for the rest of your life. So all of these things served to balance, uh, uh, served to balance um, the role of capital and the role of labor. And you add to that things like free public education, you know, the idea that anybody can go to school for free, regardless of what postal code you live in or what your last name is, until you're about age 18, it created a means for upward economic and social mobility. Um, 
So we've done these difficult things in the past. Mm. We've done these difficult things in the past. I think the greatest challenge for us now is really to going back to industrialization is to account for the original sin mm. of industrialization. The original sin of industrial ch- of industrialization is climate change. Huh. And so what's ironic about this transition is we now need to solve the uh, for the original sin of the last tra- of the last ma- massive economic transition. But to do so it, it's going it, to, it needs to, there needs to be the same kind of almost radicalism mm-hmm. that the stuff that seemed radical at the time that then became mainstream. What do you mean, you know, you have to be 16 years old in order to work in a factory? What do you mean there's going to be a minimum wage? What do you mean there's going to be, you know, two consecutive days people don't work? What do you mean? non-elites get to go to colleges. I mean, these were all radical ideas, radical mm, Yeah. when they were introduced, but they then became institutionalized. And in order to do, in order to have the kind of bold strokes um, on a short enough timeline to address things like climate change, there are things that now might seem radical and certainly seem radical to half of the United States Senate that actually have to happen, that actually have to happen. I mean, the Joe, if, if, if we are left with the climate solutions of the ExxonMobil lobbyists and moderate senators, we're doomed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, incrementalism will not serve us well. So can we do it? Yes. Is there a historic precedent for us? making these changes? Yes, there are multiple occasions in the past we can point to, but it doesn't make things any less urgent. Um, and we're beginning to see the consequences of it now. When you've got the storm of a century every 18 months, it's no longer the storm of a century. Mm-hmm. Um, but this for me, you know, this is the grand challenge of the 2020s. Do we take the very bold steps um, to address climate change? And do we make our climate and environment a stakeholder in the next social contract? It's an open question. Yeah. And, and, and so just to, just to kind of drill down a little bit, so it sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, what we saw in the sort of mid 1800s was, you know, there was, yeah, this sort of, uh, pushback against, uh, you know, the new sort of, uh, sort of demands labor that, that, you know, people that, that society was basically saying, look, we're not going to, that the social contract needs to change. Um, and that there were sort of radicalizing, uh, sort of communities that ultimately sort of pushed people in power. Is that what you see sort of what will, what, what it will take in order for government to, uh, sort of pry itself loose from the hold of the fossil fuel industry? I think so. I mean, look, it's going to be one of two things, one of which, will take too long. It's going to either be demographic change, because I actually do believe like if you do, if you look at the polling, um, which I hate looking at polling, but it is instructive. But younger people care a lot more about climate change than older people. It's as simple as that, you know, it's just it's math, right? Mm -hmm. It's math. You know, (laughs) if you poll people under the age of 30, their attitudes towards climate and environment are dramatically different than those 30 to 50. And dramatically and and even more exaggerated than those 50 and above. The thing is, we're being governed by the people who are 50 and above now. Um, Mm. In many respects, we're being governed by the people who are 70 and above. Right. right (laughs) Literally. Yeah. So one solution is demographic. I do believe that a lot of the ideas that would seem radical now in 20 years, 25 years, um, certainly 30 years would be widely accepted. But I don't think we have 20, 25 or 30 years. and so absent change by changing demographics, then what I do think you have to have are movements. Yeah. Um, the changes that took place, again, in the mid-19th century were byproducts of, of movements. They were by, the byproducts of political movements. They were the byproducts of intellectual movements. And they were the byproducts of social movements. Um, and you have to have all three. You have to have political movements. You have to have, you, you have, to have social movements. And you have to have intellectual movements to drive all of them. And I think we've seen the beginnings of them 
but that right now they are they are still I won't say at the extremes. Um, they are actually mainstream in much of the world outside of the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I spend half of my time in Europe now, and they are doing they are doing a lot of what we think is 20, 30 years out in the United States. Um, totally. But because they've had the movements that have worked and they've elected mm. officials who are behind those, behind who, who support those movements. That's awesome. Thank you. I, I like that. I'm going to uh, spend some more time looking into this idea, the political, intellectual, and, and social movements. Um, to touch back, you mentioned earlier um, a little bit about sort of infrastructure and how, you know, the, you know, we used to be able to, bu- you know, build uh, highways and, and, and r- trail, you know, uh, rail and, and, and all of these big sort of societal benefiting uh, projects, um, but that, that sort of fell out of favor. Um, I'm curious, you know, now, given, you know, what we're seeing right now, you've got a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, you know, that's passed the Senate. Hopefully we can, you know, negotiate and get this over the finish line soon. I'm curious, sort of, um, you know, do you think that infrastructure sort of being able to build these big infrastructure projects is going to come back into favor? Um, and, and sort of how has sort of the recent political movement uh, sort of since you've written the book um, sort of changed some of your ideas or not? You know, do you see uh, do you see that we will be able to that, that sort of Joe Biden will be able to deliver on, you know, this sort of let's bring people together and, and, and build infrastructure the way we used to? So the funny thing about this is infrastructure, investing in infrastructure doesn't actually have a party affiliation. Democrats mm-hmm. and Republicans are. But if you say, are you in favor of spending on infrastructure? The answer is uniformly yes. And Donald Trump, give Donald Trump credit. Donald Trump knew this. He mm-hmm. just couldn't execute on it. He said, we're going to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. But he, as with so many things, he said it. But then after the words came out of his mouth, didn't have the capacity to actually do it. Um, so the, the question then becomes, one, will there be the political will in Washington to do this and do this at great scale? But then the second thing, let's go back to some of what was earlier in our conversation. Government needs to be more nimble. Um, mm. you know, this, you know, this can't be a 10 year project, you know, with two, you know, I think about, for example, the, the bid, um, this might seem like a strained analogy, but to build cloud infrastructure for the Pentagon, I mean, this project was put out to bid five or six years ago. The prices are north of $10 billion. It's being litigated in the courts. It's mm. being rebid. It's just, we can't. We we have difficulty even when there's consensus about doing something. We have difficulty actually executing on it now. So the other thing is that government is going to have to prove. Not only can it, not only can it um, authorize and appropriate the use of the funds, but actually then deliver it. Yeah. Um, you know, and look, this is a case where I can often be very critical of China, but if you look at what China has done with its infrastructure projects. It, it, it says to me that we have no excuse. There's no reason that China has been able to develop infrastructure in the way that it has and that we cannot execute 10% as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, yeah, really, really important ideas here. Um, you know, another thing I wanted to, to ask you about, uh, you know, one of the themes, obviously, you know, that we've talked about so far and that, that is throughout the book, um, you know, is that we're living in this extremely divided uh, time, you know, like you mentioned, um, you know, tribal in a way. Uh, what do you think, and, and obviously that plays into the government's inability to get things done, right? As if it's, you know, where it, it all boils down to, you know, mansion and cinema, right? Kind of thing. Um, what do you think uh, is possible in terms of Americans finding common values or like you said, infrastructure being an example, everybody wants that. Um, You know, one of the things that I find in my research is that clean energy uh, is actually, you know, something of great uh, favor on both sides. People get it. Um, You know, what do you think is a realistic sort of path forward? How do citizens come to start sort of, you know, refinding our sort of shared humanity and, and, and shared values if that's possible? Well, first of all, I hope we're at our very worst right now. I really, I, I really hope we are at our very worst right now. I would never have 
thought that things would have gotten this bad. I mean, look, I, when I was growing up, I didn't know the political affiliations of my friend's parents. Like if you were at a little league game, it's not like you're talking about politics in, in the stands, right? But now it seems like partisan political again again almost hutu versus tutsi mm. um partisan politics is all consuming right now and it's amplified by social media it is distorted by um the degree to which we've you know to which all of our news and media information outlets seem to suddenly be aligned with with different political interests my only ho my hope here is and this is a hope i won't i won't I'm not sure how optimistic I am by, about this, is the only thing I know they can break through, this is good old fashioned leadership. This is not mm. something we can, this is not something we can outsource to our algorithms. Um, and, you know, I'm wary of sort of a great man or great woman theory of change, but that is what's produced a lot of the change in the past. It has been singular individuals who have pulled this together in times of distress. Um, what I hope is that it's not a great tragedy that pulls us together. Mm. Um, you know, I hope we. I, I would hope that it wouldn't be a, cl a climate nine eleven uh, that would pull us together or something like that. But I'm and I'm wary of that because you would think a pandemic is something that would pull us together in a more collective sense, and we've managed uniquely in the world to turn a pandemic into something that's partisan. So this is an area where I'm not as optimistic, at least over the short term. And my only answer, um, unfortunately, is in good old fashioned leadership. We have to have leaders who are committed to be bridge builders as opposed to people who are gonna burn the bridges down. That sounds, uh, yeah, I, I hope, I, I agree. I hope uh, that we can find, and, you know, I know sort of Joe Biden sort of presented himself in that way, um, you know, and I think it's sort of mixed results so far, how much he's sort of winning people over, but. Uh, but yeah, we shall we shall definitely hope for the best there. Um, well, let's go ahead. We're getting um, I've got about you know 15 minutes or so here. Um, why don't we turn to the audience and see if they have um, some questions? So if you're if you're listening in, uh, feel free to uh, put your uh, questions in the Q and A. Um, we've got uh, one here I can read out. Um, this is from Mark sure. Bregman. Um, Alec, I'm currently reading your book, but I haven't yet seen any discussion of the effect of having not paid for many of the externalities of the industrial age, environmental impact, labor exploitation, et cetera. How do you see this unpaid debt affecting our ability to resolve our current issues within the limits of our financial abilities? Yeah, well, well, thank you, Mark, for, for that question. Um, you know, I think I spoke a little bit to the question of of environmental impact. What I'll speak to for a moment is, is labor exploitation. Um, this is really a, a fairly recent phenomenon, um, if you think about it. Uh, you know, I, if you go back, you know, before I gave some data, I'll do it again. Um, if you go back 40 years, if you go back 40 years, I, I believe that's the number. Um, the top I think, it, I think it's the top 1% has grown nine, $19 trillion wealthier, while the bottom 50% has grown uh, $900 billion poorer and the middle class has stagnated. That is really a product of the last 40 years. I mean, we did have a period from it, through World War II until the mid to late 1980s, where as the economy grew, the wealth and well-being of all Americans grew. And so we're just now beginning to, I think, um, have to come to terms with how we've exploited labor at the expense of capital. Um, and what's interesting to me is to see the different effects of this. Let's go back to just partisan politics for a second. Let's, let's sort of break it into the Baltimore versus West Virginia binary. I think that in both, I think that people in, in Baltimore and West Virginia are suffering um, equally, and for many of the same reasons, you know, fa a failure to pivot to the future in the face of globalization and technology driven change. You know, in Baltimore, it was the shuttering of things like the Bethlehem steel factories. In West Virginia, it's the shuttering and automation of coal. Um, they draw wildly different political conclusions. So mm. in West Virginia, when I was growing up, 
it was a it was a state that was sort of uniformly union democrat. I mean, I think maybe even Michael Dukakis won West Virginia. You know, now the politics of of West Virginia are are nativist and um, very far right wing. By contrast, in Baltimore, in the face of the same kind of stagnation and lack of dynamism, and in many cases, as in West Virginia, uh, decreased well-being, you've seen the the politics evolve in a different direction. Um, so what's interesting to me is that people from different parts of the country and different demographic backgrounds who are suffering similarly, and for very similar reasons, their politics are going in two different directions. And what I would love to see, maybe this is a better answer to your to the previous question, you know, what could ultimately bring us together? It's as soon as the you know, workers and people suffering in Baltimore and workers and people suffering in West Virginia find common cause. But right now there's a wedge driven between the two of them even though the God's honest truth is that the solutions in West Virginia and the solutions in Baltimore are really one and the same, but there's a political wedge that's been driven between the two of them. And if they ever find common cause, then there will be a real governing majority. Mm. Yeah. And, and again, um, you know, we're, we're opening uh, the, the Q and a in the chat here. Uh, so would love to hear um, some, some thoughts from the audience. Um, and while those come in, I'll just, you know, follow up question to that, Alec would be, you know, I think that's a, a brilliant uh, sort of analysis of it, that there's a wedge, you know, that, that there could be um, sort of unification between the folks, uh, you know, in urban and rural settings um, that could benefit both of them, but there's this p political wedge driven between them. And, you know, as we've seen in in recent weeks, um, you know, we talk about Facebook, for example, right? And and you hear, um, you know, sort of uh, testif testifying in, in Congress about, you know, former Facebook employees testifying about uh, how Facebook algorithms uh, are driving that wedge and sort of fully aware of it and, and, and in, in ways exploiting it um, because of profit, which of course then comes back to the larger theme of your whole book, which is, well, why isn't um, you know government able to regulate uh, you know industries which do have more power uh, in a way in governing us than than government? So I'm, I'm curious, yeah, your thoughts on that. I mean, as as we see that happening, as we saw the last few elections, sort of social media technology playing a role in the political divide. Um, yeah, what do you think are are you know sort of some of the, the things there that can be done um, to sort of help people on both sides of the divide realize how much we have in common? Sure. So, so let me let me conclude um, with with the response to this question, which is an incredibly important one. You know, it's funny. I I know Mark Zuckerberg, and I know a lot of the the leaders of these technology platforms personally. And what I will say is, there's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. These are all very intelligent people. They have very high IQs. Um, but they aren't necessarily wise. There aren't a lot of stamps in those passports. Um, a lot of the success that they achieved, they achieved at very young age. And um, they don't understand, frankly, a lot of the cultural dimensions, the geopolitical dimensions, the psychological dimensions of their products and of their work. Um, and so ultimately what I think is either they self-govern and you know, this is what I would have hoped for for a long time. Either they figure out ways in which uh, they can produce their products and services in a way that we benefit from them. Like I use Facebook, I love Facebook, I use WhatsApp, I use Instagram, I use I use all of these products and tools, and I think they 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 are all net positive. Mm -hmm. But the negatives of them are very substantial. And either they figure out how to maximize the promise and minimize the peril of using these tools themselves, or it would be done to them. I mean, there is, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, what, what brings Democrats and Republicans together. Um, look, there aren't a lot of Democrats in the White House right now that like Facebook, just by way of illustration. In fact, you know, if you go back and read the transcript of Joe Biden's, what Joe Biden said at the New York Times editorial board when he was running for president, he made pretty clear publicly what I'd heard him say privately, which is he detests Facebook and he detests Mark Zuckerberg personally. Um, 
either they will govern themselves or they will be governed. Um, they are in danger of becoming the next Philip Morris, um, meaning that you know their efforts to put forward self-generated research, which you know, you know they they promote their self-generated research, they hide research that that um, you know tells a story that they don't want to hear. The effects of their products become clearer. They don't self-govern. They don't self-correct on this. It took a long time um, for the cigarette the cigarette industry to be governed. But eventually, because of its own failure to reform from within, it was reformed externally. And these guys are going to learn a really hard lesson um, that they will be the next Philip Morris if they don't self-govern um, effectively. And that, you know, I think it starts in the board of directors and it starts in the executive suite. Um, because there is a lot of good that comes from digitization. I am a, I'm a tech optimist. I'm not a tech utopian, but I am a, but I am a tech optimist. Um, and what I would hope is that there can be some reflection. Um, you know, people in power make mistakes. And you know, all of us make mistakes. All of us make misjudgments. Um, but the ultimate test of character of us is not whether we make the mistake or not, but what do we do in the face of that mistake? Do we acknowledge it? Do we self-correct? Do we accept responsibility? And I would say that recognizing some of the very clear harms that have taken place, you know, amplifying hate over love, over things that are positive and productive, um, you know, creating uh, spaces that allow misinformation to flourish, on things like climate, on things like the pandemic, these aren't sustain. Not only are these, not only are these not sustainable from a from the perspective of the health and well being of our people and of our climate, it ultimately will not be sustainable um, from a business perspective. Um, but there are paths forward, and that ultimately is why I'm an optimist. And even though with a title like the Raging 2020s. <laughs> It comes. It starts off angry. Ultimately, there is there there ultimately is some light in the darkness there. Absolutely, yeah. I know. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, we're like with any major technology shift uh, that we've seen, right? The, the promise of you know what's possible uh, is massive, and but all, but obviously we are going through a period now where we're. Uh, seeing all of the negatives that were perhaps unexpected um, coming up and, and sort of working our way uh, through that, like like you highlight in the book in, in different periods of history, um, you know, where we've had to uh, renegotiate the social contract. Um, loved having this conversation, Alec. Really, really uh, thoughtful, um, insightful book you have here, The Raging 2020s. Um, without, yeah, unless anyone else has any questions uh, from the audience, um, yeah, love the book, go pick up a Thank copy you. and uh, I'll hand it back over to Erica uh, to, uh, to wrap it up here. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Alec, for sharing your work with us. And thank you, Andreas, for your questions. Everyone, you can buy both their books either in store or at greenapplebooks.com. We do have a limited supply of signed copies for Andreas's book. Um, thank you, everybody. Enjoy your night. Thanks so much. Take care.